Hey everyone, I want to talk about something personal right now, and that is called surgery. Ooh, the dreaded athlete bane. Sometimes stuff goes wrong. Sometimes we go a little bit fast. Maybe you're skiing at like 60 miles an hour, and you boot out, and you put your femur into your tibia, explode your meniscus, your bone on bone. Well, it turns out, guess who's cruising for a little surgery next week? This guy, total knee replacement. So. Yes, I know what you're thinking, but don't you have good range of motion? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Do you have pain? No, I don't. So what I want to do is talk for a second, kind of personally about my own plan, and then also we're going to try to show you what I think best practices look like around recovery. So first and foremost, you know, we tend to think about surgery as a pain intervention. I usually have to have surgery because I, I'm an unrelenting pain and changing that or resetting that biomechanical uh, sensitivity in my brain may be a way out of that. And certainly that has been the case for a lot of spinal surgeries that we know, a lot of some of the other orthopedic surgeries. Um, a position that we're compensating around somehow has become sensitized. But for me, you know, one of the things uh, that I'm, we want to continue to try to give voice to is biomotor output, of course, bio, biomotor expression, force production. But the thing we're actually really interested in is your role in society, your role in your family, your role at your job and at work, and even at play. And for me, this knee has gotten to a place where my squatting is really limited, don't want to run and jump, play frisbee. Uh, I, ran a, I ran a half marathon at the Spartan World Championships, kind of a trail run, last uh, September, a year ago, and I was definitely like, that's the last time I'm gonna run on this knee. And the, the model really from the physicians and the four surgeons that I talked to originally was, hey, you know, just keep whacking things off your, t taking things off of your movement diet until we replace your knee. And for me, you know, that worked for a while. So skiing is out. Stand up paddle boarding, I had to start uh, paddling goofy instead of regular foot because that was a way of unloading that back leg. Um, starting to bug me when I ride, going downhill. I was um, paddling a big chunky class four section of river and there was a big waterfall portage and I had to have my heavy kayak on it. And going downstairs was terrible. Going down this kind of rocks, trying to manage it. And really what I came down to was I don't necessarily have pain. I have really bad feelings in my knee momentarily and positionally. But I can't generate force. I can't jump on one leg. Uh, and we're starting to see that my movement choices have been really attenuated. Now, I think if I don't have any valgus knee, um, you know, deformity, um, the amount of compensations around the knee I've been able to manage. And really, you know, when this thing first happened like seven years ago, and you can actually go back in the archives and see how I was managing then around the swelling, um, you know, that I was told that I would have like a month or two where I should just hang tough and do a little water aerobics until I replace my knee. And, you know, what I felt like was, hey, I don't know what's possible in this knee yet. Clearly, I have some significant trauma. I put my femur through my tibia. I have two gigantic bone lesions there. And, um, and for a long time, I was able to get away and buffer a lot. But, you know, there's nothing extra on the body. And for example, meniscus is seven times more slippery than ice on ice. So if I don't have any meniscus in that position, it doesn't matter how I feel or how much turmeric I take or you know, what my regen looks like or my ability to manage the kind of the problems around that. Eventually, I just, you know, my brake pads run thin and I'm rubbing on the disc. So I am now facing this terminal knee replacement or, or uh, totally replacement. Hopefully it's not terminal. But really, I want to talk about the two things. One is that, you know, I'm deciding to have the surgery so that I can continue to occupy my role with my family and play. I can do the, the sports and activities for which I train, which I'm not being able to do. And training isn't just enough for me. And then secondarily, I want to talk about what my goals are for the surgery. And, um, you know, typically, you know, we feel like potentially we lose a lot of agency when we go under the knife. That, you know, you may have control over your nutrition, you may uh, be in a great community, but all of a sudden, you know, this biopsychosocial model, which we sort of describe as in, hey, my environment matters, my, my relationship with my friends matter, my training, you know, playing tribe cube matters. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, we're just hyper-focused on the bio part. Like, we'll just replace this part. And I want to just point out that all of the things that 
uh, make us robust, durable, anti-fragile people, you know, loving relationships, managing my sleep, getting enough movement in during the day, all those things have set me up to try to be as durable as I can, be as strong as I can. Um, but in the short term, the only goal I have is to try to manage the surgical insult. So I'm going under the knife next week, I'm a phenomenal surgeon, one of my best friends is the surgical rep. Uh, you know, I feel really good about this choice. And there are some shapes where it's untenable. Getting into a deep lunge with my right leg back, it's just, it's like grinding rocks together. It's not great. And I don't create any stability there, and my brain is like, I don't know what that is, but let's not do that. And so, definitively, I've gotten to a point where the trade-offs are for having this surgery and the potential is less than sort of the, some of the choices I'm making now. Right, some of the things I'm not doing. I don't think I want to land on both feet here. I, I tend to come off the pull-up bar and land on one leg. Or I'm skiing, I land on one leg. So now's the time. So in so much that I am going to be thinking about this surgery and suddenly into the process. I'll be doing a, a, a day trip. You see, I just stood up on one leg there. Um, I kind of have a few goals. And the first goal, of course, is pain management and making sure that I have a plan to be able to manage my pain, and I do, besides just drugs, and I'll talk about this in a second. But pain is a big deal, and a lot of people are afraid of pain, but we've got lots of techniques that can help to manage this. And more importantly, as I'm going in, I feel assured that I'm not gonna be overwhelmed, because we have all the traditional models, and then I have, as you'll see, as I'll talk through in a second, some of the other tools sort of available to me that help me manage that. But pain is an issue, but I really have kind of two big goals. So this is sort of you know, one that you know, we just don't know until we get there. The second issue here is that I wanna keep my, my muscle brain connection. So brain connected to leg. So you might call this neuromuscular control, you might call this uh, uh, re-education or activation, whatever language you're, you're, you're managing. Now after significant trauma and surgical trauma, one of the things that happens with the resultant swelling is that we see people with sort of disconnected brain-leg relationships. That leg is gonna be, I'm gonna be pumped full of, uh, I'm sure, Marcane, and uh, you know, I'll be feeling good, there'll be some, some you know, pain medicines and anti-inflammatories in the joint, and that's gonna make it difficult for me to stay connected, and certainly consciously connected at first. And one of the things that we strive for is to get as reconnected as quickly as can. So some of the original, uh, if you've ever seen a knee surgery, people do active straight leg raises and quad sets and there's moving. And it's really just shorthand for, can you move? And so one of the things that I have going for me is if I can manage my swelling and I'll set this aggressive goal that I would like to be ahead of my swelling at this total knee replacement in 24 hours. And that's sort of this grand goal of making sure that my right knee looks like my left knee. We'll see how I do. I mean, that's, that's my personal goal. I want to be ahead of my swelling and stay ahead of it. Our friend Gary Reinel of um, H-Wave says best. He's like, look, if you know you're going to get an inch of snow on the step, you can go out there with a broom and sweep that thing off uh, every hour. You can just sweep inch an hour, no problem. Or you can wait until you have 24 inches of snow on that step and go out there with a shovel and that broom is no longer gonna work. So if I can stay ahead of my swelling, then I potentially see healing times improved. I'm able to decongest that area. I'm able to uh, take some of the swelling out, which is a, can be a, certainly a, a big signaler of threat to my brain. So my brain perceives that as, as painful because it's swollen and effused. Um, we can get the garbage out and bring the groceries back in, and I can keep that connection. So we'll talk about that again just in a second. But that's my number one goal. And part of that plan is we see that when we fail to really prioritize that neuromuscular connection, neural limb connection, neural body connection, we see that's when a lot of people lose their quad mass. So I have a subtle difference in my right leg versus my left leg, but it's, it's pretty subtle and only I notice it because I just can't load my right leg the way I load my left leg. That's happened over the last seven years, but it's pretty subtle. But if I wait one week or two, the research is pretty clear about the fact that your body will start dumping those structural proteins right away. This is why we see people who become highly detrained 
when they're sedentary in the hospital. And that we try to turn up the protein signaling or turn up the protein levels and activity and movement just to keep that going. And part of that connection of driving, of making that leg work, is that, uh, and one of the benefits is this miracle called anti-wasting hormone. So if you maintain that connection, between brain and tissue, especially after surgery, oftentimes we don't have to, we don't have to accept that we're gonna lose muscle mass or have le uh, leg size discrepancies because if anyone's ever had a surgery, it's really difficult sometimes to manage those asymmetries if we don't stay connected. So that's, that's my number one goal. Number two goal, as I talk about, is swelling. So what I'm really after is can I manage my pain, can I stay ahead of the swelling? And then can I maintain this connection? And you'll see that those three are highly related because if I'm having a ton of pain, I'm not gonna be very excited to move. That's gonna signal huge cortisol dumps. I'm, not, I'm gonna be stressed animal, I won't sleep. And I start to get behind on all of those things. A Couple things that I'm gonna focus on. I'm gonna eat a massive amount of protein. So I'm gonna shoot, for me, roughly, 175, which isn't many grams of protein, to 225 grams of protein. This is sort of in the realm of what's going on. And again, I may not be hungry, but this is what I'm shooting for. Um, I'll work on hydration, but mainly, the main goal for me is to be getting nine plus hours of sleep. Can I do that? So that may be eight plus a nap. And I wanna be clear here that part of the magic of this is I need to not be stressed. Seven hours or less, we, per Kirk, Kirk Parsley, uh, one of our sleep ninja friends, you're a stressed animal, eight is our baseline, you're trying to recover or have surgery or injury or chronic pain, I want you to get nine hours of sleep, which means I may need to be in bed for eight or uh, eight and a half hours or plus half hour an hour to be able to get that total sleep. And I'm definitely gonna try to be napping in here. So around the nutrition, around the sleep, those things are set. I'm trying to manage pain, get my brain connected and swelling. And my number one goal here, or my number one tool is what we call the H-Wave. Now this is the H-Wave OTC for stands for over-the-counter. It's FDA cleared to help manage congestion. It's FDA cleared for neuromuscular re-education and FDA cleared for pain mitigation or attenuation. And I wanna show you how we do it. Because oftentimes people roll in, have a surgery, and then they get a little bit behind. So one of the things that I have here is that if I use this OTC, and every one of my athletes who has surgery, we talk about this, um, from uh, high level athletes and coaches, but I basically put it on high frequency here. And what this does is it puts a high voltage frequency through the joint, basically between the pads. So if I dial this up, whoo, that's nine, through the joint. If I put this on a muscle, I'd be in full tetanus. But through the joint, I actually can't feel this right now, which means that I can use this high frequency signal to basically stop my brain from hearing what's going on in the knee. Very, a little bit different than TENS, it's not superficial, so I'm running through the joint here. And what this does mean is that I can give myself up to 45 minutes of significant pain reduction, if not pain attenuation. I can really stop it. And then I'll have some rebound. And I really can do that 45 minutes on, hour, hour two off, 45 minutes on, hour, hour two off. So it can give me some very localized, significant feeling. And I've got two leads here. So I can be doing this really massively through the joint. I can put a lot of energy through the joint and really help me to manage that initial pain. So it feels like I have an on-demand pain relief. And in chronic pain and persistent pain, this is really important. And this is why I work with H-Wave because it's been one of the few drug-free interventions that we know to be very, very powerful and to help people reduce their dependency on opiates, reduce their disability afterwards. And even the consciousness of knowing that I have this as a resource to be able to drop my pain is a big deal. Secondarily though, and more importantly, because being able to manage my pain is important, but I also, can move the pads around. In fact, I will put, and it's, I got my pants on, so it's gonna be difficult, but you'll see. I will put, uh, give a sterile package of these pads to my surgeon, and he will put it underneath my bandages. It won't interfere with my incision, but it'll be up in my quad. And what I plan on doing is when I wake up and come out of anesthesia, I'll be by myself in the hospital, Juliet can't be with me, I will turn this on and start to get immediately 
movement without motion. So I don't have to be connected because I don't have to be actively controlling this musculature. My brain on now is perceiving that there's a lot of movement happening. And this does a couple things. So notice that I'm just getting a non-fatiguing muscle contraction in here. My plan is to spend 23 hours a day moving. The lymphatic system is the system by which we are going to dump all of the sort of byproducts and swelling resulting from the surgery. It's basically, as our friend Perry Nicholson says, it's the sewage system of the body. And that whole muscular system drives that lymphatic drainage. So if I'm trying to decongest a tissue, I've got to move the tissue. But if I'm numb, or I'm, my leg is straight, or I can't weight bear on it, I may not be able to get the reps and the movement required to adequately drain the leg or adequately decongest the tissue. And subsequently, what we see is significant swelling that ends up lingering along. And as long as that joint is swelling, we're going to be delaying tissue knitting because those tissues are so diffuse and garbage out, can't get it out, which means that I can't necessarily bring the groceries in. So I have a system that's sort of backed up on the plumbing. My plan, of course, will be to elevate the leg as high as I can. I mean, laying on my back, getting it straight up, not just casually, but can I get it really up? Gravity works. But the whole system, the lymphatic system, has been backed and sort of bootstrapped in to and piggybacked on your muscular system. So the more muscle movement you can get, the more contraction in any part of the limb, because remember, the lymphatic system dumps straight up to the brain, or excuse me, it dumps straight up to the heart, basically, the whole thing ends up being sort of a one-way set of highways. So if I contract my calf, contract my hamstrings, contract my quadriceps, what will end up happening is that I'll dump the entire leg, which is really the game, especially when you have a surgery below your heart because this leg is going to be at the bottom of a gravity well, which means I'm basically going to always be fighting swelling falling to my foot. And this is why we see such swelling, big ankles, pitting edema in the knees, and pitting edema in the shins. So goal, pump, 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 pain-free ranges. It's not going to mess up in my incision. In fact, we see less scar tissue formation. Why? Because those tissues are sliding. And what we know is through mechanotransduction, I have to put some subtle input into the tissues so that I begin to align those collagen fibers during healing. What's amazing about this is because the knee is moving, I can set my quad and try to flex my quad two times a second for 23 hours, but the chances of me doing that and effectively is very difficult. So the machine does it for me. But one of the things that happens is that my brain starts to see all of this movement in the system. So when I decide to move again, the brain is less threatened. And that has been our experience across doing this for almost 10 years. Because the tissues are being loaded in a really sensible way without motion, the brain says, hey, this, this is likely to be less of a, a threat to the system. So not only do I kind of be prepped, but also I now have a cue to be able to match that myself. And what we find is we see much better connection. The swelling doesn't limit this neuromuscular connection, and I do a better job of being able to catch up with this connection sort of more quickly. So I'll be rocking this 23 hours a day. You'll hopefully see it on me as soon as we're done with surgery. I hope to be waking up and be starting this pumping, and I'll, I'll see how fast I can. If worse comes to worse, it'll be a few hours later, but I will be pumping before I try to go home. That is, that is my goal. And then to sleep on it 23 hours a day. Again, I got two pads. I can go double quads or calf and quads, doesn't matter. Okay, that's the H-Wave, OTC. Amazing thing about this company is that they will also uh, work with your insurance if you, if you tech them. Um, again, FDA cleared and they have concierge set up to help you manage this, which is really incredible. The last thing I'll just drop in here is that I'm a huge fan of blood flow restriction and occlusion therapy, and I love the kids at Smart Cuffs. And occlusion, or blood flow restriction, occlusion is the right word, blood flow restriction is a simple cuff, and normally, you know, this is probably of all the interventions that we have around physical rehab, I have to say that the the blood flow restriction training is probably some of the best, most well-validated uh, research out there. Um, we tend to use it for thinking about um, muscle mass. I mean, the, the powerlifters have been doing this forever. Katsu has been doing this forever. Um, 
all the originals, people have been kind of using this technique in, in model with cross populations from elderly, et cetera, et cetera. When we have a soft tissue problem, an acute soft tissue problem, we use BFR as one of our first things we reach for. We try to hyperperfuse the tissues. In short, what ends up happening is that we force the vasculature of the body to work a little bit harder. And so the heart's got to come up, um, the vasculature has to work hard, and what we see is this resultant sort of chemical cascade, this hormonal cascade, where a lot of the signaling gets turned on because the body doesn't think that the limb is getting enough blood flow. So we start to see like angiogenesis, and, uh, which is the development of new capillaries. We start to see um, you know, protein synthesis. I think growth hormone goes up. Tesco. I mean, it's pretty remarkable what happens. In fact, because it's such a systemic response, if I did my other leg, I can still have effects on my surgical leg. Now, what's amazing, though, is I don't always have to just do 20 reps or 30 reps and rest 30 seconds and 15 reps, the classic sort of strengthening exercise. I can use it on a much lower threshold. So I plan on being somewhere between 120 and 150 millimeters, which is usually the first like starting um, pressure for the hip. That's kind of the standard. Um, somewhere between 150, 100, 100 to 150. Probably, you know, the Normatec boots are at 100. These are 150. And um, what I'll do, though, is I can keep that on, actually, if I've got sensation in the leg. If I'm fully numb, I won't do it yet. And I can actually do that for upwards of 20 minutes. So part of my post-surgical plan is actually, because I won't be able to move and exercise very much or even bend my leg very much initially, besides walking around, is that I will use, per our friends at um, Z Health, and they have a, they've voiced this well, if one, both things work to improve something, sometimes if we use them together, we get a synergistic effect. So I know occlusion works, and I know uh, moving works, but turns out if I do the occlusion and then use the NMES, neuromuscular e-stem, to drive those changes, I basically can be working without having to actually work. So instead of being on a bike and just spinning for 20 minutes at low heart rate reserve, low VO2, I can actually just put the, the cuff on and let this thing work. And my goal is to try to get two 20-minute sessions. And a lot of the surgeons I work with locally actually use blood flow restriction on elderly people post-surgically in the hospital. So it's well-validated and it's very comfortable. So I'm not, I'm not doing anything here off-label or off the books. This is all on the up and up. But the idea here is first principles. I've got to manage that swelling, congestion, stagnation. I want to keep that leg plugged in. And simultaneously, all of those things will help me mitigate pain. If I wait around for just this passive swelling to go away, I'm gonna be a little disappointed. Now, last idea here is that I, no one is a fast healer. That is a complete lie. If anyone has said that to you, it's, it's not quite accurate. You either can heal at the rate a human can heal, or you're slower than that. So keep in mind that our physiology will govern my rate of healing. Ultimately, for this bone to grow in here, it's gonna be a three month process. But my goal is to get ahead right away in those first hours, which sets me up for success in the second day, which sets me up for the success in the next week. And the conservative approach where we take this principled idea of trying to decongest and focus on that decongestion, focusing on blood flow and reperfusion, goes a long way. This is my plan. This is the plan I've been prescribing for years. But as we say, to talk of bulls is not the same thing as to be in the bull ring. So next week, we're going in the bull ring, and I'll try to be transparent about my own healing process because I feel like we can take the principles that we're learning in regen, uh, in athletic recovery, and apply them to problems kind of laterally. And what we want to do is say, hey, these are things that have been in our universe for a long time around kind of common myofascial pain or performance, and see if we can get through some of that, uh, that downtime. Because the things we do first sets us up for the end. I'll see you on the other side.